Hello, everybody. Good morning and welcome to the Saturday live stream. Got some things to go over, so let's just jump right in. So just like the thumbnail and the title suggests, not a good day for Saab 121 as it was actually vetoed uh, yesterday late. So if you're going to do anything as far as like with government, do it on a Friday. That way people don't really complain too much. And on the weekends, they can say, well, it's the weekends, unlike us who get to sit around and talk about it. So this is actually from the desk of the Biden administration, a message to the House of Representatives and the president's veto of Resolution 109. I'm not going to read the whole thing because it gets kind of boring, but it basically it says this. I am returning herewith, without my approval, Resolution 109, resolution that would disapprove of the SEC Staff Accountability Bulletin Number 121, or Saab 121. Saab 121 reflects considerable, considered technical SEC staff views regarding the accounting obligations of certain firms that safeguard crypto assets. Basically what this comes down to is this. I vetoed it. And that's what it really comes down to. He's like, look, I don't agree with this. I think this is going to be bad for consumers. And uh, of course, this is what happened. But the question you might ask yourself is what was Saab 121? Because we've talked about it before. And uh, of course, people will tell you what it is, but uh, this is a basics of what it was. It was actually already in place. What they were trying to do was repeal it and get away from the constraints uh, that would put banks and crypto and digital assets under. So Saab 121 requires listed companies, including banks, to record crypto assets as both an asset and liability on the balance sheet. And at first glance, you're like, that sounds pretty good. I mean, have them put on the balance sheet. That's fine. That's what it was allowing them to do. And, or, or actually not allowing them, but explicitly told them to do. They would have to record crypto assets as assets liability. This is contrary to the conventional treatment of assets under custody, which usually do not appear in the balance sheets as they belong to the client. And I know this, is, this kind of gets muddled, but really what it comes down to, is it off balance or is it on balance? And one of the things uh, with FTX and a lot of the different collapses was that they were keeping things uh, on balance, meaning that they were, they were saying that we have this and we actually uh, uh, possess this as far as like the crypto digital assets. So it doesn't actually belong to you. But with this law, this requires banks that provide custody to set aside a dollar of capital for every dollar held in custody. This is unsustainable. So like, let's just say that banks for some reason were actually able to do this. That means that if you went to your bank, you're like, hey, I need you to custody my Bitcoin for whatever reason you want to do that. Of course, I will say like this, as time goes on, we know what to do with it. We know about self custody. We know how important that is, but people who are not used to that will actually turn to the JP Morgans, the Wells Fargo's and go, hey, I don't know what I'm doing. You guys should custody this. I don't care what they do to get into crypto digital assets. It's going to be a big open tent for everybody. The problem is, is that if banks had to have a dollar amount, if, if I gave my bank, USAA, my one Bitcoin, they're like, oh, well, now I have to have, I have to securitize or have security of this Bitcoin. And I also need to keep a dollar amount of whatever it's worth at the time. 60, 60, 7,000, whatever it actually is. The question I have is, I wonder how that works as it fluctuates. When Bitcoin goes to 100,000 and 250,000, does that mean they have to keep on that cash in the banks? Banks don't want to do that. What banks want to do is they want to lend everything out in fractional reserve lending. They don't want to keep the money around. It's all, it's all zeros and ones anyhow. So for this, they're like, this doesn't work for us. And that's why they wanted to overturn SOB 121. So, because they called it staff guidance, the SEC could avoid public comment in the rulemaking process governed by the Administration uh, Procedure Act or APA or APA. And it, this is what they're talking about. They say like the SEC had the ability to just kind of go in and say, this is what we want to do. That's why it's uh, a accountability act instead of being an actual law. They're like, the SEC is like, hey, uh, we want the House of Representatives and we want the Senate. We want Congress to govern us. But until they figure it out, we'll kind of make our own rules. And that's what they did. Unfortunately, the House of Representatives and the Senate both said, we don't want you to do that. 
It's just one person or one administration that said, no, 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 we're going to keep that going. And that's where we're coming to this, this big problem. So not only did the SEC bypass Congress and Comptroller General, but the commission did not even consult with the prudential regulators responsible for overseeing banks to SOB 121. And SEC Commissioner Hester Pierce says, look, this does not protect investors as banks have better experience, given they look after trillions of dollars of customer assets. So basically she's saying like, look, we put this in place, it really doesn't do much. The only thing it does is stifle innovation. And unfortunately, because of that, or fortunate enough, the House of Representatives here in the United States voted to overturn that, 228 to 182. And when it went to the Senate, that's where we thought it would get killed, but that wasn't the case. It was almost a bipartisan bill being passed. 60 senators out of 38 said we want to overturn Saab 121. And unfortunately, President Biden's like, nope, that's not gonna happen. So this is where we're at in the cycle. We'd like it to go forward, but you knew it wasn't gonna be that easy. There's always a bump across the road. So let me know what you think about this in the comments section. I think it's quite interesting as a matter of fact, but there's also one more piece to this that I wasn't aware of. It's just how badly the current administration wants to go after crypto. I didn't know this. CZ Binance is now in jail. This is happening. The SEC actually, or the Department of Justice actually uh, reached out. And of course they found CZ Binance guilty of AML and KYC infractions. And they sentenced him to four months in jail. I thought it was gonna be like a uh, slap on the wrist or maybe like a you know house arrest. But no, he's in prison today. CZ Binance uh, is serving four months at Lompoc Prison. I think I said that right. So CZ Binance, the founder of Binance, the world's largest crypto, is reported, has reported to a low security federal prison in Lompoc, California to be serving a sentence. And then this goes over, just talks about, you know, if you think FTX was bad collapsing, imagine if Binance, because that's the largest crypto exchange in the world. And uh, just for context, uh, this gentleman apparently knows CZ, says, yeah, CZ started his prison sentence in a low security federal prison. Low security means a type of prison where prisoners have the most amount of freedom because they're not considered dangerous and are trusted not to escape. Stay safe. And I thought it was interesting because I, honestly, I did Thought he was going to be like, uh, you know, some type of house arrest or some kind of commuted sentence, but no, there he goes. And I don't know if you've ever read this, but I put this link in the description. I want everybody to read this. This was CZ Binance and his apology statement to the courts as he talks about what he did. And it's just a, it's a masterclass for, even if you think you're right, you do the right thing for the entire community. And I'm, I'm not gonna go over this, but I mean, I, I want everybody to read this. And I'll, I'll read this, this first part. This was the full text of his apology letter. And he read this out in court. He says, I apologize for my poor decision and take full responsibility for my actions. In hindsight, I should have focused on Binance's compliance changes from the beginning, but I didn't. It's my fault for, and he goes on to talk about all the things that he should have done differently. I gotta tell you, it wasn't like it was that bad as far as KYC and AML. He's pretty much put himself out there to be the martyr and fall on that sword for a lot of us. So I got to tell you, hats off to CZ, hats off to Binance and everything that they did because because of this, it kind of softened the blow of what the US government is trying to do. But unfortunately, <laughs> they still want to keep fighting us. And then lastly, I will just say that even though CZ did this, you know, the U.S. government's in the choke point 2.0 and really going after, after crypto, to put this into context, there was the 2007-2009 financial crash, which was called the Great Recession. And uh, there was a great movie called The Big Short. You can check that out. But out of all the bankers and all the lies and all the manipulation and all the people's lives that they destroyed. Did you know that one banker out of all the ones in the United States and globally went to prison? Somebody named Kareem Sarah Gelden. I think I said that right. 
former exec of Credit Suisse. He is notable for being the only banker in the U.S. to be sentenced to jail as a result of the financial crisis, crisis of 2007-2008, a conviction resulting from mismarking bond prices to hide losses. And I'm not going to say, like, hey, he shouldn't have been in jail. I'm just saying that that's a bad thing. But one banker? And now all of a sudden, we're the ones that are getting trampled? It just... It, it doesn't make sense, but it makes sense because that's where we're at. Anyhow, let me know what you think about that in the comments. And then lastly, and we'll finish up and get out of here, which is this. Uh, I know there's a lot of things going on. I put out a tweet. And I mean, there's different trials that have ended. There's different prospects as far as like wars. There's different things that are you know going on in the markets, social issues and things like that. But you have to ask yourself, what does this mean for me and my family? And what am I doing to make sure that they're protected and I'm doing the right things for them? And what are the things that I can change? And what are the things that I can't change? And what are the spots that I need to do to pick to actually stand up for the things that I believe in? And I just, that's essentially the whole tweet. So I don't know what that is for you. I can't say what it is because, I mean, I don't know you specifically. But just remember that the most important thing is you and your family and the things that you're doing to keep yourself on the right track. Don't get caught up too much in the minutia. There's a lot of things that are going on behind the scenes. There's a lot of things of jockeying for power that we'll never know about. And it's just important that we take care of ourselves. And that's it for today. So look, if you like today's video, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing. Everything we talk about is time sensitive. That is it for the news portion. I wanted to keep this light because it's Saturday and it was kind of like a a negative tone of a video. But if you got to take off, it's Saturday. Go touch grass and see some sun. Have time with your friends and family. That's it.